The section's entitled The Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. The second passage is from Genesis 14, verses 21 to 24. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of the heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anar, Ashkel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power. Look, he said to his people, The Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly. With them, or they will become even more numerous. And, if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithon and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kind of work in the fields. In their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Now to chapter 5. It's entitled Bricks Without Straw. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go. So they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I did not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifice to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. The same day Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep on working and pay no attention to the lies. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and find your own straw, wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for the straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten, and they were asked, 
Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as you did before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servant this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelites' foremen realized they were in trouble when they were told you were not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. But God promises deliverance. Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought this trouble upon this people? Is that why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. I'm going to read from Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. And the second verse is Proverbs twenty-six, thirteen to 16. The sluggard says, There is a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As door turns on its hinges, so a slugger turns in his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. Good morning, congregation. I'll be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 to 14. What does a worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I shall read to you from uh, Acts 19, verse 23 to 41. The Riot in Ephesus about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen and related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. 
And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led large, large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the whole world, will be robbed of divine majesty. When they heard this, there was furious, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these are facts and undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed your goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. The word of the Lord.